Welcome to the riskadvisor.com podcast. I am Jim Henry here with my good friend and co-host Sal Lafrey. We hope you enjoy this show and ask that you go to iTunes or your favorite podcast platform and give us a, a great rating. Your opinion matters a lot to us. Today's topic, hope, fear, and common sense. This is the, uh, the next uh, in a series of, uh, of podcasts that uh, Sal and I are doing together with each other as guests, trying to tackle the erosion or lack thereof or attack on uh, common sense that seems to be so widespread now and, and causing problems in, in so many areas and increasing risk in so many areas. So it struck me actually today coming up with this, uh, you know, with this title to do this session today, having just witnessed the uproar over uh, President Trump uh, daring to be um, positive and upbeat that he seems to be uh, on the mend from uh, his, uh, his bout with COVID. And it just struck me that uh, I think this is, uh, this is really what's at the core of why we're wrestling with what the hell, you know, uh, has happened to common sense. So, um, so Sal, my thought was, um, hope for the best and plan for the worst, which we've always relied on in security, you know, seems to be a, a, a casualty of this uh, tug of war between hope and fear. So how do you see it? How do I see it? <clears throat> um, Basically, the way I see it is that we have become just one large grump of miserable bastards. Mm -hmm. It is there, nobody is happy with anything anymore. Everybody's got a bitch about something, and it's just absolutely frustrating. Um, when you, you know, when we look at some of the planning that we're currently underway with trying to get ready for the election and you start thinking about things that could happen and you look at what happened in the past, you just kind of shake your head and go, man, this just got awfully difficult because God forbid you say the wrong thing. People are all over you. And it's just, you know, we, we've lost our sense of humor. Forget common sense. We've lost our sense of humor. Well, you made a comment on a on a unrelated phone call that we had together a, a few minutes ago, you know, where, you know, it used to be, you know, some people kind of look at the glass being half full. <laughs> some people look at the glass being, you know, half empty. And you said, <laughs> I, I'm the kind of guy that just waits for it to get knocked over. <laughs> uh, but that's really it. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's not about a leaning perspective, you know, of hope versus despair or, you know, lack of optimism. Um, there's actually a polarized agenda now where if you dare to have hope, you're politically on the right, you know, and if you dare to have anything other than fear, <laughs> exacerbated fear, you're, you're not allowed to be on the left because, and that gets down to, you know, the inability to fix anything. Cause when you say everybody's got a bitch about something, well, they can, because there's something to bitch about about everything. Well, worse Nothing than that, is got perfect. Got Nothing voice. is perfect. There aren't. There's no perfect uh, police departments. There's no perfect political system. There's no perfect economic system. There's no perfect electronic security system. There's no perfect set. All of them are the best that we've come up with so far. And what has been really the 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 secret sauce to our society and the success of the country. And the success in our, you know, pedigrees of law enforcement and in electronic security is you build on what you've got so far. You throw out the bad, you know, you, you improve on it, you, you tweak it, but you don't completely forklift out everything. And well, that's, that's, the, that's the tug of war right now. Well, is anything, anything that is dared to be remotely optimistic threatens forklifting out everything. Well, you know, that's the problem, right? Is everybody and, and all of the all of the complaints, all the bitching, everything that you hear is no longer in arguments that you can have that where, where people were, you know, knew what the hell they were talking about or, you know, were at least intelligent enough about to know what they were talking about. The argument today is in sound bites. When you get into arguments with people today and you get into and, and I've gotten to the point where I don't I barely have these conversations anymore because it's just so frustrating, you know, regardless of side, it's 
everybody is talking in sound bites and they never really want to take a look at the at the total picture and you know from our side when we when we start looking at risk right we're looking at you know what are what are the things that potentially could happen what are the solutions that are potentially going to happen to the you know for it and now all of a sudden you got this third dynamic that comes in maybe even a fourth dynamic the third being you know the politics of it you know, can we can we do this? And politically, is this going to look right? Politically, are we going to offend someone? You know, politically, is there an issue? And and we've had this this discussion with guests where we looked at facial recognition about being pulled away. Right, you, in certain locations, it's illegal to use facial recognition because the algorithms that were written were written to be biased. And you're like. For God's sakes, you know, that nobody sat there and actually thought about that, right? It's it's the machine learning, right, that's looking at stuff more and more and more and learning and developing. But, you know, you, you want to look at that, let's correct that. But no, they're going to, nope, it, it's biased, it, it's a problem. And we you, you wind up losing the capability to, to be able to provide certain countermeasures, that you can't do anymore, right? Because oh, is, is this the political factor that's involved in it? And then, you know, just it goes even, you know, one step further to the to the briefing of it. If you're not incredibly careful about what you're saying, just in the briefing about the potential to the countermeasures and get to it, to jump through all those hoops, it's like, for God's sakes, how does anything get done anymore? Well, look at the irony of, of the analogy that you just made, right? Because machine learning is really our our initial attempts to have machines become as logically intelligent as people. What we're seeing right now is even these embryonic machine learning devices, which begin with a very crude you know, assessment of reality and become more and more intelligent. They improve themselves as they go further and have more examples. <laughs> if people would do the same thing, Right, we we need to have people following the lead of the mach- of machine learning because that's really and kind of getting into the logistical issues that we'll talk about, you know, in in, in the second segment. But th- there's just so much there. We'll we'll jump on that early. That is so fundamental to being able to have a solution to understand how many things that this really you know a corrupt viewpoint is is affecting you know it disables the ability to have intelligent conversations about the application of technology because you know or or what types of systems to deploy or what information that you're collecting you know immediately it's about turning the device or the technology into something that's evil and it is a tool to be used intelligently and, you know, if you're jumping to a conclusion that you want to come to, irrespective of whether that technology is maturing or not, we're going to cut a lot of things things off at, at the knees. I think if I remember my history, right, even though my double E background, you know, way back around what, going into the dark ages around 1000, 1100, you know, you know, AD, and there was this this purging of intellect. All the ancient, you know, Egyptian scholars, everything got bur- oh, burn the books, burn this. It's all evil. Blah blah. We went into the dark ages, you know. And it wasn't until I think, if I'm correct, the Reformation or something like that that we finally started to come out of this. You know, you know, about four, three, four hundred years later. I mean, that's we're we're looking at something that's not. We've been there before, you know, and it doesn't end up well. History does repeat itself. Yep. You know, when we looked at, you look at, you know, again, from the, the law enforcement security side of it, you know, we, it started out, you know, in simplistic form, it starts out with the terrorists and it was Al Qaeda and ISIS and you had an identified, you had somebody who can identify a target you can go after. They create the caliphate, which was one of the better things they could have done because gave us something to bomb and really go after, right? And yet you identify that that person. And then we went into the sort of the homegrown violent extremist and we said, wow, this is really kind of getting difficult because now we can't identify that that person, that, you know, that group will... The idiot who sits on his couch in the middle of the night on a laptop and, you know, and starts planning to make a bomb or, you know, is planning the disruption or whatever and, and winds up doing it. And then, you know, and you start to and you try and identify him and then you start looking at 
gee, we really don't have a clue. As they got better in doing what they were doing and hiding themselves better, you know, now you're, you're out and you start chasing the ghost, right? You're trying to figure out who the bad person is going to be, right? Who that bad guy is. How are we going to get them? How will we identify that person? But through all of that, you had a target, right? You saw something that was coming, right? You, you, you had something to go for. Today, everybody becomes the target. You just, you don't have that one specific target. You don't have the person who stands up and you don't understand the motivations, right? You, you don't understand a whole lot about what you're trying to defend and protect. And, and you start to realize when you look at the demonstrations and you look at the people that are, that are getting involved, the tens of thousands of people that are getting involved in these things, it's becoming the average person. And you Because the Kool-Aid of chaos being the means to the end of, you know, any chaos is constructive because it helps tear down whatever the hell we've got and, you know, clears the path for basically, you know, reinventing our society or reimagining, which is this new four-letter word I think I heard, you know, the other day. Uh, and fundamentally, that is really what's at the core. That's why there's no, you, you say, well, what's the point? What are they demonstrating again? It doesn't matter. That's not the point. You know, it's about chaos for the sake of chaos because it's just creating that, you know, it's creating that atmosphere for change. And, and that becomes the real problem because, you you know, what was, what's, what's the line we used to use, you know, a few years back, right? It's, you know, so many bogeys, so few shooters. There are so many topics. There are so many things that people are, are protesting against. You don't know where to start, you know, and you... It's it's almost great when a group like Antifa steps up and says we're going to have a protest, we're going to do this, we're going to come and riot. Great, at least now we know what we're dealing well, I, with. I, but on the debate that they were pointed out to be just imaginary, uh, you know, that they, they don't really exist. Oh, yeah. let's see. <laughs> it, I, I, what I want to know, I, I the thing that I, if I find out tomorrow I could die the day after a happy man and I would have lived a fulfilled life, <laughs> I want to know how is it that. You can put this bullshit up online, right? On on YouTube, put it, you know, put a five minute video up on YouTube, and the world believes it. Put a story out, put a post, put a goddamn tweet out, and all of a sudden it becomes gospel. I wish I could learn what the secret sauce is that makes people believe this bullshit. Because as soon as you do that. You got all the world's problems solved because they're halfway there already. In cure cancer, if you if it. you're if you're aiming that at somebody, you know what they want to see. You know that they'll basically transpose whatever you're saying to you know to fit their narrative. So, all right, we'll take a breather. That's a good place to stop segment one <laughs> and pick up the logistical impacts here on you know in segment two. You are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast, hosted by Jim Henry and Sal Lafrere. We ask you subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So continuing on that theme, I, I think it's going to take just a recognition that we're so hung up on trying to understand and address the what's of all these demonstrations that we're just not connecting the whys. And that's at the core of what's driving it. And until that is accepted, you know, by those that are trying to improve on, on our lot and uh, corporate America is trying to figure out you know, how the hell do they do they reduce their risk and, you know, and, and, and improve their security? If they continue to take the bait of chasing all the what's and placating the what's, that's not going anywhere. It's not addressing the core problem. And you got to you got to put that turret on the table. At some point, somebody's got to just recognize what's happening. Um, you know, it. we said this in an earlier show. It. A lot of what's happening in corporate America today with, you know, with, the, with the potential risks is corporations think they're avoiding the risk by paying extortion. 
if you don't give us, you know, a donation, we're going to move on. We're going to, you know, we're going to protest you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know, we're going to ruin your business. You know, at some point, somebody's got to step up and say, you know, hey, it's a risk. It's a crime. This is what's happening. How do we get that to be stopped? And when you start getting mainstream America thinking about it, and the, and the real fear here is you start looking at the millennials, you start looking at the younger generation that's buying into this and is, is believing all of this rhetoric. And you start to wonder, you know, again, I, I always go back to how do we how do we provide security? How do we provide effective consulting? How do we keep those risks down? And you, you, it's, it just seems like every other day, another tool is being taken out of your hand. And it's, it's problematic. And, and I don't know where it stops. I don't know what the solution in all of this is going to be. You know, how much further down do we have to go before we hit rock bottom? I think we're going to find out in the next four weeks. <laughs> because we know this is going to continue to... To be escalated uh, in this again, this this nuclear war between hope and fear, and uh, both sides are, are dug in so far now. Uh, you know, you made a comment that my God, you know, maybe you know, God forbid, you know, we, you know, at this point, almost a, you know, a terrorist attack might have you know a, a silver lining of actually you know uh, f- finally bringing us back together the way we were after nine eleven. And I said, nah, I don't think that would work anymore. Uh, and, and, uh, and I don't, I think, uh, we just, we just have to get to the other side of this election and then, uh, and then, uh, you know, trust that both sides can't keep up, you know, <laughs> can't keep up this, this, this fight into the, into the 30th round, you know, somebody, <laughs> they're just going to wear themselves down to the point where both are on the mat. Hey, you know, somebody's got to step up, grab both heads, bang them together and go enough. Let's go. Let's move on. You know, um, when you look at some of the planning processes that we're going through now with clients and trying to set up for the for the election and, you know, what the, the potential aftermath is to that, you know, it's it. I, I had said this earlier in the day. It's, it's the equivalent of planning for an embassy takeover. You actually have to think about your facilities in that in that way, that shape, that form. You know, you have to think about if somebody comes crashing through the door. And we've seen all of it. This is the this is the thing, the frustrating part of it. You know, we're, we're not talking about King Kong hitting a hitting, you know jumping on a building and swaying the building. You know, and you go, that's eh, not probable. All the stuff we're talking about, you know, today is stuff that actually has happened, right? We've seen them use Molotov cocktails. We've seen the attacks on the properties. We've seen the rioting. We've seen the looting. So it's not stuff that we're, we're, we're making up and saying, boy, really, worst case, you know, I'm, I'm really going to speed up the dial on this one. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to talk about how bad things are really going to get and how bad things are going to be so I can, you know, run the clock on a client. I mean, this is all stuff that we've seen on, on a day-to-day basis. And when you start looking at it, it's what do you think about you know, how do you handle, you You get overrun. How do you provide security for your security personnel, right? You can't throw them into, you can't, you, you can't, they can't be the canary. You can't let them die. You can't get them hurt. So you got to get security for them. You got to think about your elevator systems. What do you do with the tenants? Do you recall the elevators? If you do, you're putting your tenants in the middle of a riot. So what do you do with them? So you, you start going through all of these different planning processes and, and the risks. And when you think about it, it's just, you know, we're not that far. We're not that far away from. So it really is. It really is the the social unrest. Really is the the second of the one two punch that uh, corporate America is getting, uh, particularly in in multi tenant high rise buildings or office structures, where COVID exposed the fact that you know to try and repopulate, reoccupy those buildings. Now you're trying to do. The opposite of what the buildings were designed to be. The design, the buildings were designed with uh, the numbers of elevators and the pathways and whatnot to maximize the number of people that you can get in as quickly as possible. So they're not wasting time going through the lobby and into the elevators and into their office space. And now, you know, the open the, the COVID guidelines for reopening, you know, cause you to do everything. 
against what the architect designed the building to do. Uh -huh. And then, and the same goes, except that's not bad enough. Then you look at how do you deal with the unrest? Well, you know, if you have somebody that's attacking your building from down below, as opposed to a terrorist attack or a fire where, you know, all the elevators are to def default to drop down to the lobby and what have you. <laughs> now, now you don't want to put all your tenants in harm's way by bringing them down into the fray. So now looking at all your, con your building control systems, your elevator control systems, if we have that kind of a threat, we have to reverse the logic that we've had in case of a, of a fire or a, a terrorist attack. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that, you know, an, an element of the planning that we're currently looking at is a prolonged operation. And regardless of what side wins, neither side saying that they're going to concede, it's going to be contested. It's going to be very reminiscent of Chicago politics. It's probably going to be a whole lot of voting. They're going to vote often and early. And you're going to have all of these ballots that are going to wind up getting contested. So it's going to prolong the the drama for you know a month, two months. And you start looking at that and you go, okay, now you, you know, if, if things get that bad, then you start looking at what the city's plans are for dealing with mass demonstrations and how do they react. And, you know, certain elements, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter what gets you to the point. But, you know, when you get to the point that you need to do an evacuation, it's either, you know, it was either bad weather or a chemical spill or a terrorist attack. Something's, you know, you, you get to that point and you know, the city may wind up shutting down the city, you know, may put up the checkpoints, may shut down the MTA if it gets that bad. And if it does, how do you continue those operations at the property? You know, what are those, but what are those specific systems? You know, you mentioned building management systems, you know, what are those specific systems, you know, with the cold water chillers and the, you know, and the, and the heat plants, how do you keep them on? How do you, how do you ensure that they're running? How do you ensure that you don't create another crisis with those systems being turned down? And it just, Again, when you get into the weeds is where all of the problems really start to develop ongoing. It, it's going to be one hell of a ride for a few months. You know, I, I, I look at so many things from obviously the perspective of the systems integrator role that I had for 50 years or whatever. And every, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, the integrators would always be told, ah, you know. Your days are numbered. You know, look at all these systems now when we move from analog, you know, to digital. You know, you don't have to be out there changing limit switches and pan and tilts and tubes and cameras and, you know, blah, 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 blah. You don't need technicians. There. What do you need the integrator for, right? And the manufacturers is just, just plug and play. And lo and behold, we found out not quite that simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> the systems become smarter, but how they're configured, how they're deployed, round peg in a round hole versus a round peg into a square hole. Uh, you know, showed the value of that insight that systems integrators have, whether they be security systems or integrators or IT or, or AV or BMS or whatever, you know, really bring the value in trying to understand, okay, how can we use the tools that are out there to deal with this new series of threats? And, you know, this one-two punch that we've had this year, once again, has shown that you know, just when we scratch our heads thinking, okay, systems are getting smarter, machine learning's coming out there, analytics, systems are going to self-program themselves, you know, to find the network and whatnot. Geez, what, geez, what are the integrators going to be doing? There's never going to be a lack of challenges out there that doesn't require smart people with good background of, of understanding of, of, of our clients uh, and their issues that will be invaluable in being able to come up with uh, with solutions until, you know, if it's so sustained, technology will catch up with it and, again, you know, automate some of the things that we're going to now have to now have to do, um, you know, uh, you know, by by manual intervention. And that whole entire process gets way more complicated by all of the politics that's coming into the middle of it. You now have, as the integrator, you get asked your opinion a lot of times about what, you know, what are you, what are you recommending? What do you think? What, you know, what should we be doing? What are the solutions? What are the solutions we need? And now you, you, you get saddled with the additional burden, right? It was, it's difficult enough 
to stay on top of the technology and recognize what's good, what's bad, you know, what was, what was produced, like stuff after COVID, right? What, what's the, you know, what's all of the, you know, the, the bad stuff that came out, right? And you, you know, what was good. But now we get, now we get to the point where, you know, okay, you, once you've gotten over that hurdle and you see the new technology coming in, now you got to address all of those other issues, those other factors that are coming in. And it and it's and it's really sad because at at some point in time, you know, it may not be right away, but at some point in time, they were going to become victims that didn't necessarily have to become victims. And I think at you know, as as more and more people become victims, then people will start taking it a little bit more serious about, you know, how do we apply technologies that we have and the advancements of the technologies that we have that for good that are being taken off the table today. Right. Well, that's a good place to end segment two, and then we'll get to the uh, the promised land of segment three, where we will actually see if there's solutions for all this. Um, you are listening to the Risk Advisor Podcast, hosted by Jim Henry and Sal Afrari. We ask you to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event, or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So, the solution. This is going to be my, a short segment. <laughs> yeah. In my, well, it's, it's a short, there's a short answer. Uh, I fundamentally believe that four-letter word, hope, has to become what is human nature in every single person we all have, even for those that are trying to suppress it (laughs) by flag waving fear out there, you can't keep that out of the basic human psyche. Is this the hope, keep hope alive? Keep hope, you know, you keep hope alive, keep, keep hope alive. (laughs) Um, you know, uh, and in the immortal words of, uh, of a Democrat that's rolling over in his grave right now, Franklin Roosevelt, the only thing to fear is fear itself. Well, <laughs> yeah, we're giving that, that we're giving that phrase a run for its money right now. And, um, you know, it, it, it that, that's got to be where it is. You know, uh, you know, I was wrestling with all the other analogies, you know, that I can bring to, to this. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence. You know, that, that one of the most uh, uh, famous, uh, you know, uh, biblical uh, passages, you know, Psalm 23, you know, lo, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, fear no evil, right? It, it's popular because it's hope, right? And no matter how bad things get, it is human nature that we do have hope. And we really do have to uh, trust, not hope. That that will reemerge, you know, after we get through the the last slugfest of uh, you know of this election, and build on and improve the different systems and institutions and policies that we have. Because uh, to go the alternative, you know, again, and I said in in one of the earlier uh, you know podcasts is that uh, you know one of the greatest assets we have in this country, you know, is our legal immigrants that have come in from. Uh, a lot of third world countries, uh, Eastern European countries, some from South America, you know, that have lived through these totalitarian regimes, uh, communist dictatorships and what have you. We saw what the, what the Communist Chinese Party did with squashing the, the, the truth about, you know, COVID and the, and the, and the doctors that dared to try and uh, try and help. You know, uh, you know, identify the the the, the risk of, of this disease back in December and, and January. You know that that can't go on forever. The Russians couldn't, the, the Soviet Union couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't keep a lid on that. You know, for for what 80, 80 years, and then that finally blew up. I think you know we've already had a couple of attempts in, in China, and unfortunately, you know, the Tiananmen Square. Uh, episode, uh, you know, squelched it on the mainland. You know, the folks in Hong Kong are going through that right now. But human nature is to have freedom and human nature is to have hope. And that is, that's at the core of what the solution is going to be. Or we're, or we're just going to incinerate ourselves. I, I, all right. I'll, I'll play devil's advocate in this. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate. I, the ones that are causing 
the anarchy, the ones that are causing the brouhaha's, uh, the ones that are challenging everything, they have hope as well. And they have hope that it's going to change and it's going to change in their favor. That's the why that I talked to in the earlier segment. And if we recognize that's the point, not the particular issue that they say they're fighting over, but what their goal, what their agenda is. If you look at the organization, not the concept, the organization Black Lives Matter, they're open about it. They said this is what we're, this is what they're trying to do, right? It's not as if it's covert. Uh, but, but the question just, is, how many people, and this goes back to it, how many people actually understand it? How many people have actually read it? How many people really, really have the hands on that's it? That's the problem. The, if, if we have an educated electorate, then we can fix this problem. But and we if don't. people follow, people follow like sheep and don't make their own decisions and don't triangulate information from multiple news sources, then democracy fails to work. And, and you know, it, it brings up a, a larger, a larger discussion point in you know, people being able to make up their own decisions. People can't today. People have an incredibly difficult time in making up their own minds. Because everything that they are looking at, every piece of information that's being driven to them is being filtered and censored and given to them in the fashion that they supposedly want. And we're in this vicious cycle where what's being, you know, if if you're into sheep, I'll keep this neutral, if you're into sheep, then everything you get to see are stories about sheep. You get to see how to share sheep. You everything related to sheep you get. You get nothing about goats. Right. right? You don't even know goats exist. Right. And everything you see is, well, if I've seen it, then it must be true. This is this is this is what's written, right? We see this in cyber all the time, right? And we call it in screens we trust. Whatever you see in the screen, you trust. Right. You don't work. If the screen's telling you that, you know, a centrifuge is running at, you know, 10,000 RPMs, you believe it's running at 10,000. It could be running at five. But the screen said 10. Same thing here. The the youth today, and this is the scary part because they're going to be the adults of tomorrow, the youth of today, and even a lot of the adults today. Look at something online, fail to realize that this is geared specifically to them. And if, if they were anywhere close to being on the fence, then that information that they get pushes them towards the direction that ultimately the people running these social media companies want you to be. Well, I do think that uh, there's truth to that. But I also think one of the collateral benefits of uh, COVID uh, you know, has been, uh, you know, now that we're in a society where, where basically, basically you have, in many cases, two working parents, you know, when I grew up, uh, that was the exception rather than the, you know, than the rule. And I think, you know, parents back then were much more involved, you know, in the school system and the PTA and what have you, and, and really knew and, and were party to, you know, what the, what the kids were learning. And, uh, you know, as we've moved into a, uh, a, a society, you know, uh, trying to achieve, you know, equality between men and women and a lot more women in the workplace, there's a lot of benefit to that. The downside is many parents, you know, have completely turned over education, hands off because they're too busy with their two jobs to the educational system and the educational system has taken them in that direction. And in a lot of cases, the parents have not had a clue about what their kids are being taught or not taught. The, the fact that they've had to struggle, you know, with the, uh, with the home education now, uh, there's been, I've heard a lot of comments about, you know, parents saying, I had no idea, you know, what my kids were being uh, taught uh, that was wrong. And I had no idea what they were not being taught at all that they needed. So there's been, I think, the, again, I, you know, through every dark cloud, there's a, there's a silver lining. And, uh, and I don't think the education system or the relationship between parents and the educational system, you know, will be the same after we get out of, of COVID from this experience of, of forcing them into the uh, active role of, of educating their kids. To recognize them what's going on. Yeah. yeah.
So, so you believe in hope? Keep hope alive. That's the uh, uh, it, that's there's Jim a, Henry's you, message you, for the week. You, you have to. I mean, I, that is it. That is it. Because if we don't have it, there's, there's no other. There's no other solution. Because then you know you really are looking at you know just wiping the wiping the slate clean and starting from scratch, and that's not going to work well. So we we don't have a choice. This is true. This is true. Well, to be continued. To be continued. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining in and our uh, musings on this uh, very, very <laughs> timely and uh, and I'd say extremely important subject because I think it's really at the at the core of of so many risks. You know, not only from the security perspective, but you know, to to our culture and ultimately even to our health. So. Uh, you have been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal LaFrary. We ask that you subscribe to this show and like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform. YouTube, and of course, stream it at theriskadvisor.com. Thank you again for listening, and we hope you tune in again next week.